second presentation of Franco Modeni. And here we can get inspiration for, for our lab, uh, ideas for our lab sessions. So what has happened in 2015, 2016? Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, when we were preparing for the Open IFS, I asked Glenn whether he wanted me to give this presentation or the one I gave yesterday, and he said both. Uh, and luckily, um, this was actually um, ready. This was a work that we presented with Laura Ferranti last year at a meeting on subseasonal variability in, in Washington, D.C. And I thought that some aspects might be relevant to what you will be doing and the way uh, you may want to verify your experiments here. So you all know that 2015-16 was one of the three biggest El Niños we had, probably according to some measures the, the strongest one in the record. But what I would like to point out is that there was a lot of intraseasonal variability during this winter, and therefore what you will verify, so what when you verify your experiments against the observation, uh, the result will depend on exactly what period you are going to look at. So this is the outline of, of the talk. I will show you something about the observed subseasonal variability, uh, both in the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific circulation during this winter. We'll talk a bit about the teleconnection between the rainfall in the Indo-Pacific domain and the non-hemisphere circulation from analysis and from our current operational seasonal forecast system uh, for winter. Um, and now I will show you how the subseasonal variability is represented in the ensemble of our operational uh, seasonal forecast. We do 51 member ensemble. So the subseasonal variability can be quite different uh, among different members, and I will show you how this will affect the prediction. And I will talk a bit about the predictability on, on a shorter time scale than, than one season. So here is what happened uh, in reality uh, in 2015, winter 15-16. These are maps of 500 hectopascal height taken from the NOAA Climate Diagnostic Bulletin. Um, we hope that it will still be there uh, for the next El Nino. But, um, so, uh, what you see here is that the maps have some common features, uh, but also quite you know, some remarkable differences from one month to, to the other. Um, in December, it is well known that uh, December is not the month where you see a very strong signal in the Pacific. Everybody is thinking about you know, the connection from the El Nino to the North Pacific. But all the uh, seasonal forecasters in the US will say that they usually look at January, February, and March as the peak season for the response on the Pacific North American part. And in fact, if you look at the map uh, for uh, December here, you, know, you, you don't see a lot of uh, signal in the North Pacific. And instead, you, you see this very um, strong signal here um, with an in a low uh, just south of Iceland and the big ridge over Western Europe. So this particular anomaly obviously projects strongly on the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. When you move to January, uh, then the pattern is, uh, is quite different, uh, sort of wave number two pattern. Now you, you see this traditional um, low over the North Pacific, which is typical of the um, El Nino response. Um, and you get, again, the sort of canonical uh, negative Arctic oscillation uh, signal um, in high latitudes. The low over the North Atlantic has weakened and has actually moved to the south uh, to the point that actually if you project this anomaly on a standard North Atlantic oscillation pattern, you actually get a negative projection. Then we come to February, and uh, in, in February, the low uh, over the Central and East Pacific is maintained. But somehow the flow over Europe has come back to uh, 
this tripolar structure uh, that was very evident in, in December. And so again, uh, we come back to a positive uh, phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. So yeah, when you will get monthly means uh, to look from your open IFS output. So if you average the three months, you will get something you know, quite standard over uh, the North Pacific. Uh, but for Europe, uh, you will not get the sort of canonical uh, answer response with uh, a negative Arctic oscillation. Because in this particular winter, that actually only happened uh, during, um, during January. And uh, instead, you will look more like a wave number two pattern uh, with lows over the North Atlantic and the North Pacific that uh, resemble uh, Wallace's uh, cold ocean warm land pattern. Now, yeah, what I will show you now, uh, I mentioned that this map projects in a different way onto the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation. And so uh, I will show you this uh, through one of the products that we issue for seasonal forecast, uh, which is the projection of uh, the geopotential height anomaly onto this uh, first empirical octagonal function for this particular domain. And this is, and what you find uh, on our website are these so-called climagrams. And these climagrams are basically plot where we basically compare the distribution of this particular index uh, in the reanalysis. Um, and that gives, uh, this is done on a monthly basis. It's actually the only product of our seasonal forecast where you see monthly information. So the yellow and orange bar uh, give you basically the spread of the distribution of this index uh, um, in the period of the reforecast for system four. So in this case, it's uh, 1981 to 2010. The red line is the median. Uh, the orange bar gives uh, the central uh, tertiary interval. And the uh, yellow uh, gives the distance between the fifth and the 95th uh, percentile. So this is the distribution. Um, and here you actually have the projection over uh, the EOF, uh, which is there in the corner. And here at the bottom, you have the two meter temperature average over northern Europe. And it's well known that these are well correlated. So uh, positive NAO brings warm anomalies over uh, northern Europe and vice versa. The, the gray bars uh, actually give, again, the median, tercile, and fifth to 95 per, uh, percentile distribution from the model climatology during the same period. And the uh, purple bar give the distribution from the actual seasonal forecast. In this case, the seasonal forecast started on the 1st of November. So if, um, so if the purple bars are shifted with respect to the gray ones, it means that the forecast for this particular season is very different from its own climatology. So you have a significant anomaly. And um, in this case, you see that uh, if you look at the, uh, the first month, uh, November, December, January, at least, uh, uh, from the forecast from November, the, uh, if you look, for example, at the medium or, or the box indicating the tercile, that is shifted upwards with respect to the gray bar. So it means that the forecast is predicting a substantial shift in the distribution of this index compared to its own climatology. And the same uh, is true for the two meter temperature. So the model was predicting positive NAO basically throughout the winter and warm anomalies uh, over northern Europe throughout the winter. This may be most likely what you will get from your experiments. However, if you look to what happened in January, as I pointed out, January was quite different. So in January, the sign of the NAO changed from positive to negative. And we actually had some very cold spells in, in January. So the temperature anomaly um, in January 16 was actually cold. The red dots are the verification. So of course, uh, when you look at the operational forecast, you don't see the red dots. You see everything except the red dots. 
But then, a posteriori, as a verification, these plots are modified so that you can actually see whether they pre uh, how they observed a value fitted with the predicted distribution. So again, if you average uh, December, January, and February, uh, you and you look over Europe, you on the Atlantic, you will see probably a positive NAO signal. Uh, but yeah, take into account that if you do a verification, um, if you are looking on a month by month basis, um, there was actually this significant um, variability between different months. Now, why is, is that? Uh, well, of course, one may speculate, but um, the strongest source of intraseasonal variability uh, in the tropics uh, and in some parts of the extratropics as well is the uh, Madeleine and Julian oscillation. And probably many of you are already familiar with it. Is basically um, a propagation of all large-scale organized areas of convection that usually starts um, in, in the Western Indian Ocean and propagates to, uh, to the East. And um, Wheeler and Hendon in 2004 um, proposed a classification of this MJO cycle in eight different phases and proposed one index which is now widely used in the verification of um, weather prediction and, and climate models. So these are the canonical eight phases of uh, the MJO, according to Wheeler and Hendon. And this phase two and phase three are the phases where the convection is in the Western and Central Indian Ocean. And a number of studies, for example, one from Kasu uh, in 2008 on Nature, actually pointed out that uh, about 10 days after these phases occur, 10 to 15 days, you tend to have a positive uh, NAO signal in the North Atlantic. And following typically phase six, uh, after 10 days, you tend to have a negative um, NAO. So did the MJO episode occur in 2015-16? The answer is yes. Uh, you can actually see, again, some data from uh, the NOAA bulletin. Um, so these are of molar diagrams with time going from top to bottom. So starts in January, uh, June 15 and goes up to April 16. So on the left-hand side, you, you see um, anomalies of outgoing long wave radiation. So low anomalies are in the indicative of increased convection. And so you see that overall, throughout the season, you tend to have negative anomalies, uh, typically in the Nino 4 region. However, there's quite a strong mod uh, modulation, even more so when you actually look to the compensating sinking motion over the maritime continent. And if you actually look uh, farther west in the area of, of the Western Indian Ocean, what you see is that uh, you, have ne you see negative anomalies in December and negative anomalies in February, but actually positive anomalies uh, during January. So um, although the, the, the signal in the main Nino region in terms of um, OLR is, is, is quite consistent throughout the season, when you look at the maritime continent and the Western Indian Ocean, you see uh, the effect of uh, this uh, MJO activity. Uh, you can see clearly the, you know, the eastward propagation of the signal in this other of Moller diagram that shows the velocity potential at 200 hectopascal. And again, uh, you see here, for example, that this, uh, um, if you look at uh, December, uh, you actually have an anomaly of uh, negative sign, again, indicating of convection over the Indian Ocean, um, November and early uh, December. Then you actually have positive anomalies here at the beginning of January. Uh, which actually vanish again in, in February. So quite a lot of intraseasonal variability in, um, in the tropics. And now, uh, so it's interesting to try to work out how the uh, convection in different parts of this domain actually connects with the extratropics. Um, and uh, well, it's now three years ago with colleagues at ECM WF, we looked at the teleconnections in the 
in our seasonal forecast system, System 4, and particularly we look at the uh, connection of rainfall in three regions of <coughs> the Indian Ocean and uh, up to the Central Pacific domain, um, with both rainfall in other parts of the world and, and geopotential height. Um, we focused on three regions, one on the uh, western and central Indian Ocean um, that you see at the top, uh, the maritime continent, and the Nino 4 region. And what you see uh, is, a, is a comparison on these maps from the GPCP 2.2 data set uh, on the left hand side and uh, System 4 on the right hand side. And uh, you can see a sort of a common structure. Uh, in, in uh, the, uh, these are maps of covariance of rainfall everywhere with rainfall in the boxes. And you can see that there is this tripolar structure, which is basically a consequence of the dominant variability uh, um, in the walker circulation. So usually when you have uh, ascent uh, due to increased convection, for example, in the Nino 4 region, then you have descent over the maritime continent, but then again increased rainfall over the western part of the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean, so these two regions are regions where uh, there is a positive correlation between SST and rainfall. Very strong here, about something like 50 to 60 percent here. So the, the precipitation in the western Indian Ocean is positively correlated with the SST, but to a less strong, in a less less strong constraint than you have in the, uh, in the Nino 4 region. So there's more internal variability from the Indian Ocean that you have in the Central Pacific. Actually, this is an area where there is hardly any correlation between SST and rainfall, because actually the, the amount of rainfall is controlled not so much from the SST, but just from the dynamical response to the other two areas of uh, ascent. So you can see that the um, System 4 does a pretty good job in, in uh, simulating these uh, uh, teleconnections as uh, we have um, diagnosed them from uh, observed data, the GPCP data. Uh, you can actually, one difference that's quite interesting um, is that if you look at the, mm, this particular map, uh, you see that the signal associated with rainfall over the Western Indian Ocean, so the, the covariance between the rainfall over the Western Indian Ocean and the Central Pacific is actually stronger in the model than it is in the observation. So somehow the model tends to like this tripolar structure um, more consistently than, than in reality. Now if you now look at the geopotential height anomalies that covary uh, with the precipitation in these regions, um, let, let's focus on the two, the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the left is from the western uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, top are the teleconnection maps from uh, ERA Interim and here from System 4. So from the uh, Indian Ocean, you, you, you tend to get a wave number 2 structure uh, with um, a positive NAO signal, actually quite stronger uh, in the observation than in the model, but still the model captures that. While um, if you look at the teleconnection from the Nino 4 region, if you look at the observed map, you see actually uh, a negative NAO pattern. You don't see this very much in the, in the model, and the reason uh, we think is because of the stronger link uh, between the Indian Ocean and the Central Pacific uh, in our models. So since the, the Indian Ocean tends to give uh, a positive NAO, if you actually always associate El Nino with a strong convection in the Indian Ocean, you will tend to get uh, a positive a NAO as well. However, uh, one has to say that if you look actually to 2015-16, uh, the observed average for the season looks more like this map than the top map. So because I, as, as I said, it was a, the mean response in this year was not the sort of canonical uh, response to ENSO that uh, you see in this particular diagram. 
Now, of course, you can do things in reverse and say instead of uh, starting from the tropics and seeing what happens in the extratropics, you can start from the uh, NAO signal. And it's interesting to do this now, to compute these covariances the other way around and to do them month by month. So uh, if we now take, we compute uh, the NAO index as the projection onto the first uh, Atlantic EOF, and you compute the covariance of rainfall everywhere, um, and you do it on a monthly basis. Uh, well, first of all, of course, you see the traditional shift of the precipitation to northern Europe, which is characteristic of positive NAO. And then you see in, in December, again, you know, uh, this characteristic tripolar structure of precipitation uh, in the tropics. When you move to January, the connection to the central Pacific, it's actually tends to vanish, but you still see uh, this dipolar structure between the Indian Ocean and the maritime continent. In February, most of this signal is actually gone. So when you actually average the, um, the three months together, you have a rather weak signal. So this is, a, this is a problem that has been noted by many authors, that when we try to connect the uh, response of ENSO to the extratropics, and especially in Europe, um, often doing the traditional seasonal Everest tend to wipe out the signal because the signal is actually different in the early part of winter and the late part of winter. This is something that Fred mentioned uh, yesterday. And again, so this is some aspect that you may want to see um, in, in your model, whether you get a different response in the early part of winter uh, when this, this tripolar structure seems to be stronger. So in fact, the best, we found out that uh, also from looking at the observation, the best index for uh, this uh, uh, wave number two pattern is actually a combination of uh, ascending motion over the western and central Indian Ocean and sinking motion over the maritime continent. If you construct an index, uh, basically as a dipole index between these two regions, the same as you can do, for example, for the NAO between you know, uh, Iceland and the Azores, uh, and then you teleconnect this index just in, in December and January, then you get a very strong extratropical response uh, with this characteristic wave number two pattern. So February doesn't contribute very much to this particular correlation. It's actually stronger in the early part of, of the winter. Now, uh, I, I mentioned that different uh, uh, ensemble members can represent this intraseasonal variability in different ways. And so I already showed you that if we put all our uh, ensemble members together, the model tended to stay in, in, a, in a positive um, NAO state throughout the, uh, throughout the season. However, some ensemble members uh, did show the uh, intraseasonal variability. So what Laura did was to pick up the best five members in System 4, in the sense that those that showed the largest change in the NAO index between December and January. You remember, you know, we had a very positive NAO in December, it went to negative in, in January. So if we pick up this member, then uh, the geopotential height anomaly would look like this in December, and the temperature, two meter temperature over Europe will look like this, so very strong NAO signal and positive anomaly. And then in, in January, you move to the structure with actually a positive anomaly over the Arctic, so a negative Arctic oscillation, and that is actually associated with cold temperatures. So some members actually manage to do the same as the real atmosphere, but only a minority of them. So we try to understand why it happened and try to relate it to the convection in these regions that I showed you uh, before. And these are maps of 200 hectopascal velocity potential anomaly uh, for this, the five best members uh, on the left and the ensemble mean of all the 51 members on uh, the right. And this is, what, um, this is the anomaly in December and this is the anomaly in, in January. And both these five members and the ensemble mean show that this very strong signal that came 
from the Western Indian Ocean. So negative um, velocity potential an anomalies are indicative of enhanced vertical motion and convection. So all members were probably quite consistent in getting the decrease uh, in the activity over the Western Indian Ocean. However, if you actually look at the uh, maritime continent region, there was quite uh, a difference. So the best member actually sh showed uh, an intensification of uh, the, uh, the sinking motion over the maritime continent and the ascending motion over the Nino 4 region. So somehow the, um, the strength of the worker circulation, while in December was mainly between the maritime continents and the Indian Ocean, actually shifts um, in January to a more traditional uh, El Nino pattern that has, in fact, you know, the, the canonical reconnection as uh, a negative Arctic oscillation site. If you, um, if you look at the ensemble mean, um, yeah, the, the, the change over the Indian Ocean is there, but you actually, if you actually look at this feature, there's actually a weakening of the two centers over the maritime continent and, and the Nino 4 region. So somehow what it seems is that the anomaly in the worker circulation shifted from being mainly uh, over you know, the West Pacific and the Indian Ocean uh, in December to the, uh, to the Central Pacific uh, in January. And this basically changed the response from uh, a positive NAO to a more uh, canonical negative Arctic oscillation signal. So if you run your 10 member ensemble, uh, you may get some of them that, you know, this, this first of all, uh, we have to say that some seasonal variability, it's hard to predict beyond the first, let's say, month or two months in the best cases. So uh, it's not very easy to predict what happens in January starting from the 1st of November. So don't be disappointed somehow. Uh, usually subseasonal variability operationally is limited to 30 or 45 days. So probably some of your members will show the change as it's depicted in these panels. Some of them will look more like the ensemble mean. So this is just to um, warn you about the possible differences that you uh, may find uh, in your ensembles. Um, now in this prediction, of course, uh, there's, also, there's another factor apart from the inherent predictability, and that is the fact that all models have systematic errors. So in some sense, it's usually easier uh, to predict some transitions um, in, 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 a, in a model if the model tends to like one, you know, the state towards which the atmosphere is actually moving. And actually, so if you uh, look at the same um, climagrams uh, for uh, the North Atlantic oscillation um, here and the two meter temperature anomaly from actually operational seasonal forecast starting not on the 1st of November, but 1st of J December and the 1st of January, uh, you actually see that uh, even from the 1st of January, uh, the model actually did not do this transition from positive to negative um, NAO, even if it you know, had one more month. <laughs> but actually, if we started from the 1st of January, then it actually got the return back to a positive uh, NAO signal correct. So the transition from positive to negative was not well forecasted on a range of two months, but the transition from negative to positive was. And we think that the reason is because somehow this, in February, there was a, a return to a situation similar to what we had in December, which is a situation with, uh, which the model tends to reproduce more easily. You know, I showed you that the model likes this tripolar structure and tends to actually um, enforce a tripolar structure on the rainfall anomaly. So we think that the difference uh, uh, in the predictability on the two-month time scale um, was somehow related to the fact that uh, the model went back to a state which is more somehow consistent with uh, its own dynamics. 
Okay, the, the conclusion is just a summary of what I said. And so we hope that this may guide uh, y the way in which you um, look at this, uh, at your experiments and the different ensembles. And I think that Glenn um, has, in so we have included this Western Indian Ocean as one of the boxes uh, that can be analyzed with the MetView script so that uh, you can actually look at, for example, time series of evolution of rainfall and this is in this particular region, which is quite important for the teleconnections. <laughs>